Absolutely. You fell into a rushing river full of rapids and you found a log to grab onto that saved your fucking life. Yes. Now you've gotten to calmer waters. Yeah. And so maybe it's safe to swim away from the log for a little this bit. Is single, maybe you could even make it to shore. Maybe you get halfway to shore and you're scared. And so you go back to the log because you're not strong enough yet because you're tired from surviving those rapids. There's no right or wrong here. No. So saying that first feels really important. Yeah, 100%. The letting, like the being still with myself and my thoughts, I think the only thing that really helps is this deep, 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 deep understanding that I have and knowing that I have because I've already survived the worst. I've already survived hell. This is single and probably asexual with Kendra K. Zeke, stop licking. <laughs> and we are back. <laughs> Please put Zeke, stop licking in the intro. Continue. I might have to actually. <laughs> he's got his little cone on right now and he's, yeah, he, you know, he's a special boy. You know him. Anyways, hello. I am here with my good friend, Nico. Nika slash Nico. And I met Nico maybe like five years ago now. Six? Five years. I, five. I forget. Five or six. Pandemic. Exactly. Because I forget that like the pandemic was so long. And when I think about meeting friends in like 2015, it's actually been like eight years. And but I think it was maybe like five or six for us, something around there. But mm-hmm. anyways, um, good friend of mine, Nico. Nico currently resides in Hawaii. Um also we will do this as well. But I well, and you know, I met Nico in Seattle. Nico has their own podcast as well called the Non-Binary Body Image Project. It is amazing. You all should check it out. It is seriously incredible. I recommend it to so many people because, and it, and you seriously gave me so much like inspiration to start this, my own podcast as well, because mm. I love hearing about the non-binary perspective. It's not something that I under, like that I know because I'm not non-binary and I understand, I understand things now about getting pronouns correct because it can be triggering and harmful when Mm -hmm. you're either called a she or a, or a he, and you no longer identify that way. And so I've just been learning a lot through Nico and their podcast, and you should really check it out. Um, Nico is in Hawaii and they will tell you about the land that they reside on. I will tell you right now that I am in Bellingham and I am on the land of the Lummi nation and the, um, Nooksack tribe. So we love and respect all of those people who are here and who have come before us. And I will turn it over to Nico now and have them give Mm. you a little introduction of themselves. And then we're going to talk. Amazing. Thank you, Kendra. And thank you for inviting me to be on your podcast. It's such an honor to talk to you. And it feels really good in my heart that... Um, you know, the way that we connected was because of both of us putting ourselves out there in an authentic way. And that's always been a thread in our relationship. And, um, you've been doing it the past few years. Yeah. Life you've been moving around so much. We, yeah, I do. I do appreciate that about us. We are not afraid to put ourselves out there and try new things. Yes. 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 So happy that, um, the non-binary body image project, my authentic expression could be, inspiring for you to use your voice and I'm I'm excited to be with you in your style on this and thank you for the land acknowledgement I am in the um, kingdom of Hawaii I am on the land of the Kanaka people and um, I want to say thank you to them and also to say thank you to my ancestors who got me here today and to just call them in to support me in this talk with you today because we're going to talk about some really fun stuff and some really difficult stuff uh we are we're just gonna vibe and see where we end up at the end of this (laughs) it's gonna be great (laughs) yeah and then just a little bit about my background i'm a licensed mental health counselor i've been practicing for about a decade now i graduated at the ripe old age of 23 i'm 33 now took some time off in there and discovered myself as an artist and a poet 
I've got a book out of poems uh, called I Should Give You a Ladder. You can find it on Amazon or on my website. And then, of course, the podcast, The Non-Binary Body Image Project. And then I also do a grief group and grief retreats called Wild Morning. And those are based in healing grief through the lens of nature. Mm. I didn't know it was through the lens of nature. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. We learn about all of the elements found in nature and learn how um, to recognize when grief is like when those elements are disrupted in our bodies through grief and what those symptoms look like and how to bring ourselves back to center. Yes. Also with like the change of the year and the seasons and stuff, you're going to need different things at different times of the year in order to equip yourself. Witchy stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's all witchy stuff. It's all witchy stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. So that's a little bit about me. I love it. And yeah, Nico is currently living in this amazing little apartment, literally on the water. In Did on- you just say literally? <laughs> I could have. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I meant to say literally, probably like a British accent, but <laughs> literally on the water and you're probably getting so much natural healing right now in so I much. can't even imagine. But I'm super excited to chat with Nico today because I had posted one of my last interview episodes with the, my good friend Zach and we talked about celibacy. And then Nico reached out to me and was like, we should talk about celibacy some more because Nico themselves are celibate for over a year now, you were saying. Just up on a year. It'll be a year the second week of January. Yep. Basically there. We're we're Mm -hmm. rounding up. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I was so excited when you reached out and wanted to talk about this because it is such like, like I said to Zach on uh, the episode I did with him, it's such a taboo topic. And, and it was really cool to hear about Zach's perspective because he was a former celibate and he's no longer celibate. So I'm really excited to chat with you. I'm the reverse. You're the reverse. And you had also mentioned that you were someone who identified as like hypersexual and then going Mm -hmm. from being non-celibate. And most of this time that you've been in Hawaii has been non cel like you, you know, celibacy, which is really just spectacular. I can't, I mean, fuck sex. Let me just go lay on the (laughs) beach for six hours and get like vitamin D. I'll get that sort of vitamin D or whatever. Like that's (laughs) like you were saying with your wild morning, it's the nature that is so fulfilling. So let's just dive into this. So you've been celibate for a year. Was this an intentional decision or no? Okay. Talk to me about it. No. Um, It did not start out as intentional, I should say. And then it became intentional. So I went through a very difficult heartbreak at the end of last year, beginning of uh, 2022. And, you know, historically in my life, I am no stranger to heartbreak. I have gone through, I've had many relationships, some of them long term, some of them very short a lot of them, um, most of them actually in the wake of my mother's death and in my grief state. And so, you know, and I've talked about this um, on other podcasts and I've written about it, but just one of my biggest grief responses shows itself through the element of fire mm-hmm. and fire responses often look like substance abuse, you know, smoking is the use of fire, drinking is the use of fire, and sex is also a fire substance. It's a fiery act, passion, right? You could also argue that it's water because it's with your sacral area, you know, the that sexual place, but right. I identify very much with fire to escape my grief, and that is my favorite element to become imbalanced in. What is your sign again? Aries, right? No. I have an Aries moon and Leo rising. So I have a lot of fire in my chart. I'm a Taurus sun. Thank God, God to help Taurus. balance yes. me out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. So yeah, not, um, not an overstatement to say that historically in my adult sexual life, I have felt very hypersexual, very 
motivated by seeking sensation. Like that's really what the core of it is. It's just seeking sensation, seeking to feel something different than what I was feeling. And my main way of doing that was through sexuality. Right. And, you know, drug. it it's is. High. Yeah. It absolutely is. Um, and this year I also got sober. So my celibacy journey does not at all feel separate from my sobriety journey. Yeah. And celibacy, I feel like had to come first Mm. because in being so free with my body and I do want to say, and I shouldn't have to preface this, but there's absolutely no judgment towards anyone who expresses themselves in a sexually free way. I'm very sex positive. Absolutely. I I had my slut days. I say slut with love. Yes, absolutely. It's an adjective. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a bad word. Just like fat. It's not a bad word. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Um, and in letting go of seeking to feel better through relating with other people in a sexual way specifically, that really forced me to come into stillness with myself in a way that I hadn't been able to do post my mother's death, Yeah, which was, it's going to be the six year anniversary this year. Wow. Mm-hmm. So Kendra, you and I met like right after my mom died. So you've seen That's right, yeah, the fucking roller coaster, <laughs> and just the progression of you as a human, going from Nika, who had long hair and who presented more feminine, to yep. who you are now, who just feels like a more in line with who you are spiritually and like at your soul and at your center, and you can just mm-hmm. you know. Like when you cut your hair, I know that, that was so freeing for you. And God, thank God Alejandro was there to document that experience too, mm-hmm. of like shaving your hair. But yeah, it's like you you just, you came into yourself. Yes. And I'm so honored that I was able to be there like through that time, actually. I mean, I know like, you know, we met, we weren't, you know, talking every day, but like, yeah, that was right before your mom. Mm-hmm. I feel even like more special to know you and like come yeah. into your story when I did and vice versa for you and me. Yeah. It feels really special to me too, because that was a time of my life when I felt such intense shame for every aspect of my being, because I was so consumed in my grief that I was, you know, I was acting out of character. I was behaving in ways that didn't feel in alignment with my integrity. Um, And at the same time, I was finding myself. I had like all the structures in my life, everything before that kind of crumbled away. And so I was like, very much in this identity exploration place. And for the folks who met me during that time, it's like, you accepted me in my full chaos. And that's so special. You have, I mean, you got to, I mean, you don't have to, but they're like, there's just like the, a narrative that I've been getting in my life right now. And like, you even mentioned it on our phone call the other week when you said thinking about moving back and who is going to be there for me, who is going to still remain there for me throughout all these transitions in life. And I feel like I've been dealing with letting go of people. Some of us have been letting go of the same person and it's kind of, it comes down to who is there to not judge you, but to pick you up and still be with you and understand that nobody is perfect ever. Mm -hmm. And Because like, I think I saw you for you when I met you and, and like, and this is how I like see a lot of my good friends in my life and how I'm going to continue to see people in the future is if I really love you, I will be there for you and I will stick Mm -hmm. through you. But there's, yeah, there's like this level of, we just got to love more and judge less. Yes. (laughs) Because you were going through grief you still are I mean we all still are with our Mm -hmm. own experiences I'm still I feel like I'm still grieving my best friend who passed away which was in Mm -hmm. 2017 I think it was actually maybe around the same time as your mom yes it was was. way less vocal about it I think it was maybe because it wasn't my mom it wasn't a family member but she was still someone that was so important in my life and Mm -hmm. that's a hard place to be and yeah just Mm -hmm. accepting people from where they're at is so big and loving yes 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 and I will say real quick Kendra there's no such thing as a hierarchy of grief absolutely so 
even if the people that we lost are different, yeah. Your experiences are just as valid and meaningful and painful and important and worth speaking as mine. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're, no, you're right. There's no, there's no hierarchy of that whatsoever. Nope. We all experience it in very different ways and it can catch us off mm-hmm. guard and it can derail life and mm-hmm. it's hard, but you've done such a great, I mean, you know, when you lose a parent, I think I thankfully I don't know what this is like yet, but when you lose a parent, there is so much uprooting of who you think you were and your life and all of these things. And you've been you've been going through this process so beautifully and you've also turned it into mm-hmm. art with your poetry and your writing and the the women who wore war group and then also your wild morning group. Like you've really leaned into grief instead of letting grief overtake you, which is beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for saying that because my fear moving through those, like that acute time, right? Like the acute grief of the immediate aftermath of my mother's death was that the grief was consuming me. And at times that was absolutely true. I felt like trauma soup. I felt like I didn't have a body. I felt like a puddle on the floor. I felt completely unlovable, Mm -hmm. felt like a monster, all of the things. And you're right, especially with the death of a parent, it's like having your tether to the earth cut. Like I was just in outer space, right? no clue what to do. And the way I found my way back to my body was through sex. Mm. the collision of bodies brought me back into my body yeah it's one of those it's it is one of the things that can just get you because it's so physical Mm -hmm. it's all physical but then it's also spiritual and all of these other things Mm -hmm. and it's Mm -hmm. it's easy to fall onto because it is instant gratification yep feeling that you need something to just lift you up yep And physiologically, you're right that it is a drug and that it can become addictive because the hormones and the chemicals that are being released in our brains when we have sex or when we're even just um, emotionally intimately connecting with someone, you know, for the asexual folks out there, like the the hormones of oxytocin and dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine, like all of these things are alive and working in our brains when we're connecting with another person. They're just like amped up when we're being sexual with them. And there is a like merging of um, cells and fluids and all of these things, right, that happen. So when I was having sex with a lot of different people in the early stages of my grief, I was not at all thinking about it through a spiritual lens. I remember so distinctly saying um, to one of my partners I was dating during that time, like, yeah, I don't feel an emotional connection at all when I have sex. It's literally just a physical act. Like I could have sex with anybody. And I was having a lot of one night stands. Like there was a time when I would only match with, and I would only fuck travelers on Tinder. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you're like there's no point there's no chance of me running into you on the street <laughs> exactly and so like to bring this full circle back to celibacy which is what we're talking about today the entry point into the hypersexuality for me was grief but the entry point into celibacy for me was also grief mm. because of a heartbreak right funny how the two can have like the same, you know, the same driving force to do something or yeah, to like release Mm -hmm. yourself in some way. Mm -hmm. And I think about, I was talking, actually had a session earlier today with a client and um, it's so, it was so funny. It felt like prep for this podcast, honestly, because um, she was talking about how, you know, oh, in the past I had my slut era and I had sex with a lot of people and I felt good about myself. And it was this ego boost, right? Like there's also in our culture, something about feeling sexy, feeling desirable, having the capacity and ability to quote unquote, get laid. Yeah. Is it's almost like a competitive sport. Yeah. This is how the economy and the patriarchy have quite literally set it up. (laughs) Sex sells. We need to be desirable. We need to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. This is life affirming stuff that everyone must comply to. So as like an asexual, it's just like, whoa, 
I don't even have these feelings, but yeah, I mean, this is our entire world is kind yep. of like in like intertwined with sex. Mm-hmm. It's, it's crazy. It could be mm-hmm. the like a simple children's movie that has sexual innuendos and puns. It's just, it's all around us. It's everywhere. everywhere. Yeah. And then that like sense of self-worth and self-esteem coming from your sexual desirability and ability to have sex. And that's one end of the pendulum. And then the other end of the pendulum, you know, we find celibacy and not engaging in sex and how to find your self-worth in that space as well. And so my client was talking about how they've been in the celibate state for a long time haven't been dating, but you know, they had their slut days. And so we were talking about how to find the middle place of the pendulum. And it was wild for me because in my head, I'm like, I don't fucking know. I <laughs> like, I'm going through the so same the thing. Cel- yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's wild to me how often my clients present with issues that I am also currently present day working through. It's gotta be like tough in some ways. Cause you're probably sitting here as a psychologist, like how do I help this person navigate their feelings when this is, yeah, like a same issue that I have been feeling mm-hmm. or that I'm currently feeling and I don't have the tools necessarily to even tell myself what to do. How mm-hmm. the hell am I going to tell somebody else what to do? Mm-hmm. I mean, I know the therapy is not telling anybody what to do, but you're giving them the tools and the guidance. That's so fun. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say is the good news. I don't have to tell them what to do because right. that's not my job. Exactly. My job is to help them get in touch with their own body's wisdom and their own intuitive knowing of what is best for them. So I'm just there to create the conditions in which they can hear their own inner voice. Right. Um, Um, which is what I always return to in myself as well. But all that to say, so many tangents. Hello, ADHD. Oh, same, same, same. This is why (laughs) I anticipated that we were probably going there. We're probably going to talk for a while and I love it. So I'm here for it. Beautiful. Girl, Um, girl. (laughs) celibacy, psychology. (laughs) Um, And oh, I'm not a psychologist. I'm a licensed mental health counselor. Love it. So that's a good distinction. Yeah. I don't want to misrepresent myself. People get real squirrely about that. Yeah. Not, neither do I, of course. Okay. Perfect. Mental health um, therapist. Yes. Love it. Um, so I didn't choose celibacy at first. I just felt completely incapable of the idea of even opening myself up to another person again, because I was in such a state of heartbreak that it was like, there is no fucking way I can open my heart to another person right now. I really need to take some time to just be with myself. Almost like a blessing in disguise. It was hard at first, but very necessary. Yes. And so in the past six years, This is the longest stretch of time I have ever, well, actually my entire life, this is the longest stretch of time I have ever been single Mm. and celibate and not dating. Yeah. Just not dating. Yeah. After my mom died, the longest time I went was three months at a time, Mm -hmm. which is not enough time to process things. No, and so but- I would just carry whatever had happened in my last relationship into the next relationship and cycles would repeat. And then I'd find myself right back where I started, but a little bit more battered and bruised. And I finally went through enough of that, that this time, this heartbreak was like, nope, I'm not putting myself back in the dating pool. I'm going to return to myself. I just need to be alone for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, I, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful blessing in disguise, you know, probably because that you were not in a good place after your last relationship and like also, but just how beautiful, like source and your ancestors and your guides really work because here you are in one of the most magical places in the world and you get to just heal and be and there. And I love that you like, there's no pressure for someone like you who has felt like they were high, who was hypersexual for a long time. Mm-hmm. And then coming to this point of it being a choice for you personally. And then also just being in this place where 
it's so beautiful and it's also so new and different, you know, especially, you know, growing up in Illinois and then coming to the Pacific Northwest for so long, you're just, you're in this space where you can just freely be you and heal, which I think it's so cool. Mm. And I love that. I love this journey for you (laughs) as someone who has been celibate for a long time. I love this journey for you. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. For the first time in my life, like not even just post mom's death. Yeah. That's such a like big marker in my life. But for the first time ever, yeah, I feel a deep sense of peace and calm and equanimity. Yeah. And equanimity means the ability to be present with any kind of disruptive thing that happens in life from a place of staying in my center of being in the middle of, of being able to experience big emotions in response, but to come back to that center place. Right. And And to not get totally knocked off and derailed and like spiraled into using drugs or spiraled into having sex with strangers or, you know, whatever the fuck we're taught that like, we need to cope. So we're either going to cope with sex. We're going to drink. We're going to smoke. We're going to do all three. We'll do all three at the same time. And it's mm-hmm. hard to be with yourself. It's hard to be single. It's hard to be abstinent from sex. It's hard to have yourself be in this place where you are not allowing things to come in to mess you up. And like mm-hmm. not all people will mess you up. Not all sexual encounters will mess you up. But even just the act of sex is this release, but you can also release on your own. But mm-hmm. a lot of people, like you said, you said, what, three months, like in a right, right. was the longest time, but we, we dive back into that because it is such that like instant, like instant gratification of release. You feel better. Mm-hmm. You're, you know, the, the, uh, you're validated. Exactly. Your brain chemistry is going the on. Chemistry is going on because you're releasing all these, you know, the, what is the, the word I'm looking for? The happiness, the oxytocin oxytocin too yeah endorphins endorphins yeah and that goes to your head and it yeah and it's very pleasant it's you know people Mm -hmm. we love people who obviously have sex we love people who have sex if they're not in a relationship we love people who have sex if they're polyamorous but it is hard to be with yourself and not have that release and to sit with yourself and learn like well, how can I make myself feel better or how can I move through this stage of my life without doing the things yeah. that we're reliant on in the past? Because we, yeah. are, we are the own our own little universe and everything that we have inside of us is the answers and we can always fall back on that. But we need that like space and that time to learn about ourselves more in that way. And mm-hmm. it's hard. It's hard, mm-hmm. but very rewarding yeah. too. It really is. Yeah. Like the peacefulness that I feel. Yeah. The long-term reward. It's not that quick sex, short-term reward. It's the long-term, the long game. We're in it for the long game right now. (laughs) My new motto is I am far more interested in pursuing satisfaction Mm -hmm. than I am in pursuing short-term pleasure. Yes. I love that. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And satisfaction is built up through consistency yeah. and satisfaction is built up through integrity. Yeah. It's doing your and daily. presence. Yeah, exactly. Presence. I was just going to say, it's like, it's doing your daily routine of lighting a candle and meditating and reading for a couple hours a day. And like, the more you do that, it's like, this is what I'm looking forward to. Like, I'm mm-hmm. looking forward to that time and that space that I just get to have with myself where I feel like I can infinitely grow. And mm-hmm. And I want to say too, like, I'm talking like I live like a a saint. Like I've been joking with my friends, like, oh God, I'm just like living this Christian lifestyle. Like I'm not drinking and I'm not smoking weed. I'm not using any drugs. I'm, I'm celibate. I, and I feel this peace. Like what the fuck is going on? Who am I? (laughs) I am no saint. (laughs) (laughs) And satisfaction like yes all those rituals and routines are so important but it's also grace and compassion when we don't always get it right Mm 
And I don't even want to use that language because it's not right or wrong to have ritual and routine in your life. Right. However, it's very grounding and a way to come back to yourself over and over again. So like one of my rituals Kendra is writing my morning pages. Like I'll write three longhand pages in the morning when I first wake up. I haven't done that in like a month and it's okay because I'll come back to it. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. I am not someone who is very ritualistic either. I've never been the person to have a morning routine, but now that I find myself out of the van and back into the apartment or into an apartment, I have been doing things that feel a little more ritualistic because the van life, you know, it was so like sporadic and who knows what my day was going to look like. Um, But yeah, you're right. It doesn't have to be this everyday sort of thing. Even if you're reading a couple times a week and that's Mm -hmm. more than you've ever done before. Like, great. Yeah. You feel the gratitude slowly by slowly. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing is, is there's nobody telling you what you need to be doing in life. And if there are people out there who are judging or critiquing you, then obviously they don't need to be in your life, but you create your own base, you know, mm-hmm. if your base looks like meditation once a week, maybe if that brilliant, Great. it looks like twice a week reading brilliant. If it looks like five days a week, reading one week, brilliant because we're so adaptable and we change all the time Mm -hmm. too and it's not like Mm -hmm. yes maybe there are some people out there some ceos who have these strict routines and good for them but i also don't Mm -hmm. want that life i don't want that hustle hustle bustle life i want the slow life i want to at least pay my bills have Mm -hmm. a little extra money for myself to travel to buy nice things for people who i love if I see it in a store, but we're creatures of also habit, but then we're also just kind of primal in some ways too. Yeah. Every day can be totally different. Yeah. It's that middle path. It's finding the middle path there, you know, there's value in going to the extremes of the pendulum in, in life, you know, and grief will always take us there. Grief will always take us to the edges of the pendulum. Right. And the journey back to that middle way, the middle path is just, that's where we find our sense of contentment. That's where we find our sense of peace. But without the contrast of the edges, we Mm -hmm. wouldn't even know that it was fucking peaceful. (laughs) Very true. Yeah. You've got to know like the opposite end of the spectrum like or understand it in order to know, you know, like Mm -hmm. I know what depression, depression feels like. I know when I am down and out and if I'm feeling you know, certain amount of way from that, that point over here, like that's, that's great and amazing. And, but there's Mm -hmm. also no progress either in life, especially with grief. You can be mourning hard one month or one year. You could be mourning hard Mm -hmm. for your mother in the next five years, but like these last four years have been like somewhat okay. It's yeah. Our bodies are probably know this as like a mental health therapist. Like our bodies are so, you know, different. And especially Mm -hmm. like with you being celibate now, I wonder, you can probably like answer this, but I wonder if there are things or aspects of your life or aspects of grief that have come up for you now in this time of celibacy that have never, love it. I want to talk about it. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, You know, in part of my story, I've spoken about it before, but I have a lot of sexual trauma in my history and um, some of that in childhood, a lot of it in adulthood, actually, because I was, um, well, you know what? No, I'm not going to say that because it's never my fucking fault. It's never my fucking fault. However, I was vulnerable to it because I was in that grief brain state. And so I was in situations in which I wouldn't have been had I not been compromised in that way. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yes. So in celibacy, you're absolutely right. Our bodies are all different and our bodies hold our stories. Mm -hmm. And when we're using our bodies in specific ways, whether it be through sex, whether it be through compulsive running or over or under eating or whatever the fuck your coping is, it's a way to silence the story of the body. Mm-hmm. So yeah, <laughs> let's just like take a breath with that. Yes. Yeah, Inhale deep in. 
<sighs> yeah, wait, repeat that last part again with the body. When we are reaching for our coping, whatever that may look like for you. Compromise to the body. We are silencing the stories of our bodies. Yes. Yeah. We're not allowing our bodies to fully express the stories that are alive in them and therefore let them go because we're using something to cover it up. Right. Mask down those feelings that are coming Mm -hmm. up to Yeah. Yeah. And for me, it was sex and cannabis. Yeah. So with both of those things gone from my life, the amount of releasing I've had to do in my body, particularly in my hips, Mm. is crazy, Kendra. I now have this Mm. habit of when I'm going to sleep, I have to rock my hips back and forth like this in like a self-soothing motion. And it happens all of the time and it never, ever, ever used to happen before. But it's trauma coming out of my body. It's just releasing little bit by little bit. Yeah. And before it wasn't happening because I wasn't attuned and present enough in my body and I was using these things to cover it up that it wasn't coming out. Yes. Another example of that is um, earlier this year, I popped ribs in my rib cage because I went to the rage room. <laughs> is that those one of those rooms where you just bash a whole bunch of shit? Yes. Yes. Oh. You go in and you pay to break shit. I and so, it. but you really, you broke your body. <laughs> the I broke my body because I, you know, and even as a counselor, like I should have fucking known, but I was not prepared for the amount of held back latent buried suppressed rage in my body that was gonna come out of me through the embodied action of breaking things like imagine my tiny frame with a giant fucking sledgehammer (laughs) going crazy (laughs) breaking a printer yeah and 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 breaking things and I just was so in the like releasing of my rage that I wasn't in, I wasn't paying attention to my body. And so I ended up popping several ribs. And you're kind in of that still process. in recovery ish. Yes. Right? Cause you can't, yes. they have to, they have to like, it's, they just have to go back like on their own. Right. right? Well, the chiropractor has popped them back in several oh, times, but they good. keep popping back out. and if this isn't a metaphor for healing anger i don't know what fucking is he told me the ribs that popped were the ones connected to my heart chakra in my partner love space and my family love space and i was like oh well that makes perfect sense yeah there you go (laughs) wow yeah and the thing that i like kept screaming over and over in the room because you know it's just full-blown free expression and how often do we get to do that in life just fully express our rage i just kept screaming fuck you for leaving yeah over and over and over again and you know that's rooted in my adoption story so that's like a deeply embedded feeling in my body fuck you for leaving yeah and probably a little bit with your mom too even though you know yep It was kind of, you know, it happened and it it was that, that was how her body was naturally supposed to leave this Mm -hmm. earth, but it was still like, fuck you Mm -hmm. here. Yep. And that happened right after, and here's the choice, not choice with the celibacy, because that happened right after I got back from studying mushroom assisted therapy in Jamaica. And I got back to the Island and I was like, you know, feeling so expansive, feeling so ambitious, feeling good, feeling on top of my game, like, all right, I'm ready to go out there and date. Right. And, <laughs> and then I popped my ribs and my body was like, fuck you. You literally be extra still. Extra You're not even going to be able to move. For months, I couldn't do my dishes. I couldn't fold my laundry. Like I had to rely on my friends to help me. I felt, yeah. I've never felt so vulnerable. Yeah. And like, if you had wanted to have sex, there was no I way. No. <laughs> no way. Oh my gosh. That is, that is just quintessential life and universe just I know. Let me just squeeze on in here and really make sure that you're taking this time seriously. You're really going to be celibate. You're really going to sit and think about your feelings. You're going to listen to your body. 
for maybe the first mm-hmm. time ever. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Like really deeply have to listen and like relearning how to move. Like Dan? I'm a dancer. Yep. Yes. And like not being able to dance full out. Um, you know, not being able to swim in the same ways. Mm-hmm. Like uh, the rib cage is involved in everything. It's our heart center. And, you know, it felt like a really perfect metaphor for grieving too, because that's what happens in grief. Like your heart gets broken, your ribs pop out and everything is impacted. Right. Everything changes. How you move changes. So how are you feeling today with that? Is it better, worse, same? I'm pain free. Good. But the ribs aren't all the way back in. <laughs> yeah. Is this still going to help with chiropractor and possibly yeah. still just like stillness within your body? Well, now it's to the point. So this is the pendulum thing again, right? Because I needed deep stillness to heal it. And now I'm needing physical training because the issue is that the joints, like the ball and socket or whatever, it just keeps popping in and out. And so I need to strengthen the like musculature and tendons and everything around it to keep it in place because the chiropractor can use brute force to get it back in, but that doesn't mean it's going to stay. And that's also just like refueling. It's like, we can try and push our way back into alignment. And unless you're building up the strength through everyday actions, it's not going to stay that way. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Jeez. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten that almost that that happened to you. And oh, what a like, also divine timing. You're in Hawaii healing from that, not only healing from just the past few years and the death of your mother and relocating a couple of times. Now you're Mm -hmm. physically healing, which is so funny because you said earlier about the body, how, you know, we don't listen to the body and our body becomes compromised and we don't hear it. And so we do these things like smoke and we have sex in order to make the body feel better in order to make our mind feel better. And here you are literally at stop because you have to make your body feel better. And then you're also doing these things that you used to do in the past to cope that you are no longer doing. So this is like intense, intense, like yeah therapy in a way yeah it really was and then the chiropractic care on top of it all you know like working with the bones like literally manipulating my bones back into alignment and that like bringing up the healing of a lot of the sexual trauma too um yeah it's wild yeah and if you, anyone who's listening is interested in Nico's past and her, their story, they do have the first episode of your podcast is your story and it's mm-hmm. very beautiful. And if you're interested more in hearing all about everything, I, again, I highly, I highly recommend the podcast and I highly recommend that episode as well. Thank well, you, how Kendra. Wild, how wild is that? I know. I know it's crazy, but I'm grateful for it because I don't know that I would have had the self-control to not go back to dating, to not just like find a lover, Yeah, you know, going back. That was such a big part of my identity. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Part of your grieving too. Mm -hmm. The love and comfort from others. Mm hmm. Yep. And I mean, like, even my identity as a poet and an artist, so much of my poetry is so sex focused. It's like, in the first book anyway. Right, right. Exactly. I love that. So with, I mean, aside from the physical damage of your ribs and like literally the physical damage, sorry, there's a ambulance, the physical damage of your body which is so intense and insane. And you're right. The ribs are so they're. It's kind of like your abs, like, um, like I'm not about to like promote working out or anything like working out is also healthy, but a lot of like, a lot of things like also revolve around your abs. You can be kayaking Mm -hmm. and you're working your arms, but it's also working your abs. So your, your ribs are right there. It's the core. Mm -hmm. And there's so much that can be compromised. You can't swim anymore. You can't dance anymore because it's the base almost. It's not the Mm -hmm. base. You know, you could think of your root or your feet as the base, but it's kind of like 
the mm-hmm. hub to the to everything else, all your other mm-hmm. extremities and stuff. So, oh my gosh, it's got to be tough. But with being celibate now, aside from like physically having to literally calm the fuck down, <laughs> because your body is like, you can't do it anymore, babe. Yeah. What has been like when you have like, so let's say like before the rib accident too, like what were some of the things that would come up for you? almost like those urges and how would you tell your, yeah. Like how would you talk yourself out of it or what would you do or what came to, what came to you either spiritually or ancestrally or via the land? Mm. Like what were some of those things that would come up during those hard times after you had committed to being intentionally celibate? Yeah. So I made the commitment to myself to be celibate for a year just to see what happens. And you're almost there. I'm almost there. And now I'm like, should I just do another year? <laughs> Five years later. <laughs> I know. I'm like, but I feel so peaceful. I don't want anyone fucking with my peace. Please. Um, it's always there. You can always have it whenever you want. So it's, mm-hmm. but this time with yourself. Yeah. Right. You know, I would say, okay. I'm going to talk about this actually through the lens of sobriety instead, because to be honest, being celibate hasn't been that hard for me, which feels shocking to say out loud, like given my history, right? Because I remember in the early stages of my grief after my mom died, it literally was like physically painful to go without sex. Like I remember one time turning to a coworker at the bar I was working at and being like, it's been two weeks since I have sex. I'm going to die. (laughs) <laughs> like that yeah. was so long like I couldn't even fathom yeah going like if I went a week I was like okay I need to have sex and I had like had agreements with friends like okay we're literally just using each other's bodies that's what this is right right <laughs> and now and you're, just, you're like I can keep like going, probably <laughs> yeah like I don't really feel that intensity when it comes to urges like I just don't and um I think it's because I now have a much deeper understanding of what sex is for me outside of just the physical act but of it being a spiritual act and not wanting to merge my energy with just anybody in that spiritual sense. Like it feels like the consequences are too high. The cost is too high. Yes. And so that's a really great deterrent. And it's not that I like don't have desire. It's not that I don't have libido. Here's a fun fact. Um, now when I masturbate, I can come in like five minutes. It's awesome because get the job done. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Because I'm not, you know, engaged in that with anyone else. So I get this pent up energy and then I masturbate and it's so easy. Yeah. Yes. So it hasn't really been that hard to not have sex, Yeah. but what has been much harder is giving up cannabis. Sobriety right. has been much, much harder. So I'll talk about those urges. Absolutely. And you know, I'm just about to hit my 90 day mark. So I'm newly sober, Good for you know, you. thank you. Yeah. And I've been sober before in the past five years, but it has never been with this amount of intentionality and commitment. So I am in the program. I am working the 12 steps. I have a sponsor. I, you know, am working with my higher power. I am working in this spiritually oriented way in a way that I never was before. And that is making all the difference in the world. And there is a 12 um, step to cannabis. It's not yes. just AA. Yes. I love exactly. that. And that's actually, yes. I mean, great for a lot of people to know because now that yeah, cannabis- marijuana anonymous exists. Yeah. Love that Mar- marijuana anonymous. Cause now that cannabis is so readily available to a mm-hmm. lot of people, especially on the West coast. I mean, there is mm-hmm. a so every other block, it feels like, especially in Washington, people think you can't be addicted to weed. Yes, yes you can. Yes, yes you, you can. can. I for you can one have- know that as well. 
<laughs> yep. Yeah. You and I have talked about that so much over the course of our friendship. Yes. Um, and it's such a shameful thing to feel so powerless with a substance, especially one that culture views as relatively safe and benign and that people right. don't take you seriously exactly. for. Because thankfully, it's not something as detrimental as alcohol. Yes, it's very much more like neutral on the body. But when you are either consuming it too regularly and it's, you know, you're losing, you know, yourself, that's that's an addiction right there. And it's Mm -hmm. totally relevant. And I, for one, will admit that Mm -hmm. I am addicted to cannabis and I am still working through my ebbs and flows of it as well. But it is a total thing. It is a real thing. And just because it's a safer outlet to use other than like hardcore drugs or alcohol, it is still, right. it can, it, yeah, it, you can still be addicted to it and it can still affect your life. Yeah. Anything that you don't feel the ability to stop using despite the negative consequences of that usage in your life, whether it be through, you know, consequences on your work, in your relationships, Sex. in your day to day, in your health, whatever the fuck. Yep. If you don't feel like you can make the choice, like addiction is the absence of choice. Right. Yeah. And for someone like me, you know, coming to the place of um, admitting my powerlessness was really difficult because hey, I'm a counselor. So like, I'm the helper. I don't need help. Right fuck off. Right. <laughs> um, and B, you know, I remember, I'll never forget this. I had a therapist once say to me in session many, many years ago. So you think you can outrun your genetics? <laughs> and I just wanted to punch her in the face because it, <laughs> it was like, yes, bitch, I do think I can outrun my genetics because I was adopted. And that's the story I was told. Yeah. You're like, it's that, in fact my right to outrun this bitch. <laughs> exactly. But the truth is I never stood a chance because I was born addicted. I was born addicted to cocaine. My yes. brain was formed in the womb yes. through addiction. So it was always going to come to this. And thank God I never picked up anything except for cannabis. Right. Because, right. you know, anything that God. genetically predisposed, like you could have like easily yep. dipped into other things that were a lot more harsher than weed exactly. or alcohol. Yeah, exactly. And so when it came to finally making the choice to get sober this go around, I was really in that deep place. I, I don't know what to call it other than a spiritual awakening of, mm-hmm. oh my God, I really am powerless with this substance. I'm using it at times that I don't want to be using it. I'm using it despite the negative consequences in my life. I don't even feel like myself anymore. I don't even remember who I am anymore because I've been high every day for the past five years. Yeah. Who am I without this drug? Yeah. And, you know, I could, I could logic it all I wanted to. Like I could do all the mental gymnastics in the world because um, I was using it medicinally to medicate my PTSD, which it can be really useful for folks with PTSD. I was using and it to medicate my fibromyalgia pain. ADHD. Yeah. It helps. And ADHD. Yeah. For me, it's like, oh, I can focus for five seconds of my fucking life. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so you know, in a lot of ways, like cannabis is the reason I'm still alive. It's, it helped me so much. It was my life raft during the time when I didn't think I was going to make it. And so I have a deep honoring and like reverence for that plant and gratitude for that plant. Absolutely. But what is the difference between medicine and poison? Yes. Yeah. One of my spiritual advisors, if you will, her name is Candace Love. I went to um, her and her husband's retreat in Tulum, Mexico earlier this year. It's called the Remembering Me Retreat. Mm. And every time she pops up on Instagram Live, I took notes from another dear family, soul family member that I met on that trip. Her name is Sarah and she lives in Brooklyn. And I remember her on that trip, she was talking about how Candace has been in her life for so long. And she goes, every time I see Candace, 
you know, popping up on her lives. I, I, I shut down everything that I'm doing and I grab my notebook and I grab my pen and I listen. And the other day I, she was on live. And so I was just, you know, I'm editing. I'm also watching the Mindy project. So I pause the Mindy project. Yes. I set up Candace's live and I continue to edit. And I'm like, what am I doing? Close my laptop. I pull out my notebook and my pen. And one thing that she said on that live, she was talking about addiction And she says, there is this part of you that is used the substance. And then there is this part of you that can be free of that substance. And then the one thing that she said that stuck with me, and I just was typing it down when you were speaking, is she said, what version of yourself are you going to let win? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I shut my laptop and started taking mm-hmm. notes. and forever more I will always take notes when I listen to her lies because she's always got so many good nuggets but that was so it was just serendipitous too it's like needed to hear mm-hmm. that when I because I've struggled with addiction with cannabis too and it was that was just so powerful to hear like what version of yourself are you going to let win this past version or this current version of yourself or the future version. Future that you know. version. Exactly. Yes. We're going to let the future version win. Yes. You have to be able to imagine your life sober. Yeah. And it really like to return to you. Because this all started because you asked me about how do I cope with urges. Right. When the urge to smoke comes. And it still does. Yeah. Like I still get cravings. Right. Especially if I'm dealing with something really emotionally difficult. Like talking to someone in my adoptive family or, um, you know, seeing the person who assaulted me in the news, both really big triggers for me. But again, like talking about that equanimity, right? Like being able to experience these things or having a conversation with my ex, Mm -hmm. being able to experience these things and then not reach for the substance. And what is helping me is that first step, Mm -hmm. admitting that I'm powerless, Mm -hmm. that second step, finding out who my higher power is, Mm. you know, for me, it's nature. And that shows up in my work. Yes. And connecting with my higher power. And then third, having faith and trusting and surrender that my higher power will lead me and guide me to where I need to be. Yeah. Powerlessness, trust, faith, and surrender. And someone for someone like me who like having a sense of sovereignty and having a sense of like empowerment, is so important in my like aliveness. The thought of admitting powerlessness as being the key was just like so difficult for me and remains difficult. Like I still struggle with it on a daily basis. Like, no, I am powerful. I can make my own choices, but you know what that thinking gets me every fucking time is Mm -hmm. right back to using Mm -hmm. because then I think, oh, I can manage my behavior. Oh, I can just Mm -hmm. use a little bit. Oh, I'll just use with friends. Oh, I won't do it alone. And then where do I end up? Right back where I started using all day, every day without my own consent. And I relate to that so much. And I think we both come from this position of we have both worked for ourselves for over a decade. Yes. It is hard to tell. It's hard to take input from people. It's hard listening to people telling you what to do. And it's hard. It's like, I'm going to smoke today. Fuck my, or, you know, whatever my body is telling me not to do or all this stuff. It is hard to let go of that control especially mm-hmm. when you are so fiercely independent, not only in life, but how you make a fucking living. Yeah. Yeah. Which is all connected with like, you know, my addiction healing and recovery too, because something about working for myself is both so deeply good for me and so deeply isolating. And so Ooh, I hear that something that came so strongly for me in Jamaica was just the reminder of like, to be well, I need community yes. to be well in my work. I need community. Yes. And so, you know, whether that means staying in my business and just, you know, hiring other counselors to work with me, whether that means joining an existing team somewhere else, I know I need to be working with people and that feels really yeah. good to me. To, you've made this realization, you know, for the longest mm-hmm. time you're like, oh, I got this. I got this. Cause I remember, yeah, on our phone call, you were talking about that. You're like, actually I want coworkers. I want that. Yeah. That space. Someone's doing the mm-hmm. same thing that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's hard to find that when you work for yourself. And like, and especially like me as a photographer, like I know a lot of photographer friends, but it's not like there are a lot of support groups or communities. Cause sometimes there, I mean, our business no. is so different. Like you're a family photographer. I photograph people naked and yes, we're doing the same <laughs> thing, but it's kind of different and it's very yeah. isolating at times. Yes. And then for me, I'm in this place of, well, I just have to seek my own community outside of my work because this totally. is what I was destined to do. As you and I both know, I am amazing at what I do. I'm yes. not giving that up for anything. So I feel I hear you so much there. And I have been, I've always been a big person who has a lot of friends and people in their life, but now I'm trying to find, like, I hate this word. Because as a person who works for themselves, I know I need to do this sometimes, but I also just want to hold up in my apartment and just stay safe from COVID and other people's Mm -hmm. emotions and opinions. But (laughs) finding like a network of people and even if it's just casual communication or a little meetup and we talk, chat about our businesses, it's that's so important. It's so important for those who work individually. And I think everybody should seek that out as best they can, either finding a company to work with where you can have coworkers or finding another source of people to talk and relate to. Even a consultation group. Yes. You know, even like a, a, what the fuck are they called? Not a think tank, but like a, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know all the lingo. I'm not with it. No, me either. (laughs) (laughs) Me either. (laughs) Yeah. But I know I have to be like aligned with the lingo, not like aligned with the lingo, but aligned of the actions of like Mm -hmm. network or in your same. Yeah. None of us are going to make it through this life alone, period. We can't. We can't. Which feels like such an interesting statement with, you know, the main theme of this convo being celibacy, which is like returning to self and being alone, right? Yes. Um, but I don't think that the, that that has to mean being alone because the truth is, is being celibate and working for myself and, and being, living alone, all of these things, right, have allowed me to come to this place of groundedness and stability that allows me to connect more with other people than Mm -hmm. when I was like constantly fucked up from relationship drama or, you know, being hung over on cannabis or just being constantly stoned or the financial stress that comes with being an addict. Right. And working for yourself and working for yourself, trying to hold it all together. Exactly. Yeah. None of us are going to make it through this life alone. We need other people, period. Yeah. Which, yeah, it is so ironic because of the topic that we are talking about. Uh huh. But it's true. It's true because we need, we don't need support in sexual ways. Some people do. So, you know, again, it's like you and I will probably very much well have sex again with people in the future, but Mm -hmm. the support is community and some people Mm -hmm. have sex with their community and that's great. They're mostly poly. We love it, but it's, it's a different, if it's, it's it's a different kind of support, but it is kind of ironic because it's like, no, get away from me. But also can we chat (laughs) about like life? (laughs) Can I tell you how I fucked up my ribs in this rage room and the irony (laughs) about coming home from Jamaica and (laughs) Oh my God. Putting myself right back in my bed. (laughs) Right back in my bed with no partner, just me. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever find, so my, I have come leaps and bounds with my journey with cannabis and it's definitely been a rocky one for me and I'm very much still in it. I use edibles from time to time, but I was such a morning, afternoon and evening smoker and you being sober now from cannabis, what has it been like to just sit with your thoughts? Cause that is one thing that has also always terrified me of Ooh. letting go of that because it is a way to decompress. And it's also a way to mask how my body is feeling, how my emotions are feeling. And for someone who lives on their own, suffers from depression and anxiety, works for themselves, mm-hmm. these, this vice that I've used for my whole life, it, 
reminds me less of the things that I have to stress about in life or where I'm at in life or thinking about, fuck, what if I choke in my own apartment and it's just my goddamn dog here who's probably just looking at me like "Mm," all of these things and like the, you know, the release that cannabis has given me and not delving into this further black pit that I so easily know how to get in, myself into as mm-hmm. someone who has suffered from depression for most of their life. What has that been like from you being 90 days sober now? How, like, what have the, what has the thought process been like? Oh my God. Well, first of all, the first two weeks I couldn't stop crying. Like sounds about just right. Weeping yeah. at anything, at any yeah. little thing, just crying, 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 feeling so much. Purging. And yeah. Yeah. Purging those emotions. Yep. And I will say, I don't think that everyone should be sober. Right. I don't think that that's the solution for everyone. That's not. I am an addict. Right. I need sobriety. So I'm speaking for myself here and I'm not going to put that on you either, Kendra. Like I don't, only you can know if sobriety is the answer for you. Right. However, you know, and, and to acknowledge, I think that there's so much shaming that comes from using in any capacity when you're talking to sober folks. Mm -hmm. Um, I have experienced it from close people in my life. Yeah. Fuck that. Um, Less judgment, more love. Yeah. Yeah. As I'm like, fuck that, which is so judgmental. (laughs) (laughs) But but we're fucking the judgment. That's (laughs) Fuck the judgment, the not the person. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's like first find that compassion and that that like appreciation for the life raft that it has been for you. Right. What has because it has gotten me through already? How it's absolutely, me. absolutely. You fell into a rushing river full of rapids, and you found a log to grab onto that saved your fucking life. Yes. Now you've gotten to calmer waters. Yeah. And so maybe it's safe to swim away from the log for a little bit. Maybe you could even make it to shore. Maybe you get halfway to shore and you're scared. And so you go back to the log because you're not strong enough yet because you're tired from surviving those rapids. There's no right or wrong here. No. So saying that first feels really important. Yeah, 100%. The letting, like the being still with myself and my thoughts, I think the only thing that really helps is this deep, 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 deep understanding that I have and knowing that I have, because I've already survived the worst. I've already survived hell that there are three things I know for certain. One, there is no such thing as a permanent emotion. Mm Mm-hmm. No such thing doesn't exist. Yeah. Can't happen. Yeah. One thing we can always count on, our feelings will change if we sit with them long enough. Mm. Two, our thoughts are not facts. Yes. Big one. (laughs) There is this quote, and I forgot where I heard it, I think it was the Aubrey Marcus podcast. And they said, 90% of what happens to us doesn't really happen to us. Exactly. Isn't that amazing? It's what we, we are creating. We yes. create the stories. We re, we re, we re listen to the conversations we had with right. the person five minutes ago. 90% of it really doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. Like the vision that you have of yourself choking in your apartment and Zeke just watching you. It's just, it's a fallacy. It's not even true. Yeah. Right. One of my favorite um, meditation exercises to lead myself through and to lead other people through when I'm struggling with scary thoughts, because it sounds like a lot of what happens for you is panic. And panic feels intolerable in the body because it, it both has a physiological response. It, it causes, you know, a rapid heart rate. It causes sweating. It causes tension in your belly. It causes gut issues. It causes muscle tension. It causes pain. It fucking hurts yeah. to be in panic. 
Yeah. It's being in survivor mode for so long that I don't know what else. Exactly. But the cannabis brings me down. But yes. And then when the body is in a panic state, the mind will reflect that. And vice versa, if the mind goes into panic, the body will reflect that. And so there's this feedback loop that we get stuck in. And you're right that cannabis for you has been the interrupter of that feedback loop. Right. But there's so one of the disconnect. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, is that it's a short term solution. Right. It's not actually solving the problem. So if you imagine like emotions as a wave like this, like the panic comes in, it crests, it peaks, and then it rides out. What cannabis does is it lets you get to right about here. You don't get to the peak of panic. So you don't have the panic attack, right? So it feels right. like it's helping you because it's bringing you back down. Right. But when in reality, what's happening is that it's putting you in this place and then keeping you there. It's cutting off the top of the wave and right. not allowing your body to actually complete your panic response. Yeah. And so that's why you keep needing it yeah. to maintain that feeling of relief. Yeah. Because it's not allowing your body to complete what it needs to complete. Right. Yes. And sometimes feeling the pits of despair, it's necessary because what comes from that? It comes growth or it comes a solution of an answer to what you've been searching for, for mm -hmm. yourself. So you said two thoughts are not real. And I, I want to yeah, get thoughts are not the facts. one because thoughts are not facts. Yeah. And, and I just want to make sure the, you know the third one too. We yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. One. The meditation for the thoughts are not facts. And I learned this um, in an acceptance and commitment therapy training. And I just really loved it is to imagine yourself sitting in your apartment or sitting in your home and it's a dark room and there's a thunderstorm going on outside and on the television screen is a horror movie. And there's lightning flashing and thunder like going afternoon. <laughs> I'm a fan of the horror movies. Sorry, continue yep. with the analogy. And there's a horror movie on and you feel really scared. And so you decide, okay, wait a second. I can get up and I can go turn on the lights. Okay, that feels a little bit better, but there's still this horror movie going on and I'm really distracted by it and I hear people screaming and I hear the thunder and I see the lightning and I'm still scared. Okay, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. Okay, I feel a little bit better, but this still isn't working. All right, I'm going to call a friend. I'm going to call a friend and the lights are on and I'm drinking my cup of tea. Yeah. How am I feeling in my body now versus when I was sitting in the dark room alone watching the horror movie fixed to it? We never turned it off because we can't turn off our thoughts. That's the horror movie. Yes. But we can change our experience with it. Right. Yes. Cannabis is your cup of tea right now. Mm -hmm. Cannabis is the warm light. Yep. That's okay. For me, it's not okay. Because my brain's fucked, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not an all or nothing thing. Yeah, exactly. That was a, yeah, that was a beautiful, beautiful analogy. Um, And then the third and final thing, give me a second. You can always trust your inner wisdom. Mm -hmm. but to get to the inner wisdom you have to get to the point where you can observe your thinking and you can let your feelings move through you without interruption right the inner wisdom falls in the middle there yeah yeah that the inner wisdom it just reminds me of like <clears throat> my you know the higher self and your guides and I was saying this to one of my clients recently, and I think it was when I was experiencing a lot of the mechanical issues with my van. And I was just at a fucking brick wall, $20,000 plus. And I was just, I was borrowing money from my parents and all of this stuff. And then I found myself for a week or two up here in Bellingham, which is where I currently reside. And I had all of this stuff going on. And I remember I was talking to 
my client because it was right the day before and we were doing an outdoor photo session for her out at one of my favorite places here in Bellingham. And I was just Mm. like, she's an intuitive witch is like, she's total witch. That's her business and everything. So we were just, you know, vibing off of each other the whole session. And then I was just thinking, I was like talking to her and I was like, I just, you know, I always suppress what I know needs to happen or like listening to that inner wisdom and listening to my higher self and my ancestors Mm -hmm. and my guides coming in because here I was having such a hellish week. And now I, by fate and by my schedule, I was placed in one of my favorite places ever at one of my favorite locations ever or or surrounded by some of my favorite people ever. And I was just like, you just, I have to just lean in more to whatever is happening because I know that something else on the other side can be like, this is why all of this was happening. Look where you are now just for a second of like a breath. And then you're back in the shit. Mm -hmm. Go with it. Be in that second for as long as you can, because it will keep going up Mm -hmm. and down. But yeah, the inner wisdom. Faith and surrender. Faith and surrender. I'm going to add a fourth. Love it. The only way to create a life that feels tolerable to you meaning a life in which you can be present and embodied in without reaching for escape, whether that be sex, food, exercise, drugs, alcohol, whatever, is to become very clear in yourself about what your values are and then work your ass off to make your outer world reflect your inner world. To create a life that feels meaningful to you, to create a life that feels worth living Mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. And if you've been in a place where you feel suicidal or you've been in a place where you feel deep in the pit of depression, you know, and for the Pacific Northwesterners, we know the weather has a big impact on that too. You're in the heart of winter right now. We're in a mental health crisis. People are struggling. Yes leaning into these principles of my thoughts are not facts. Yep. No such thing as a permanent emotion. Yep. And emotions cannot kill me. Literally they cannot. Yep. I can trust my inner wisdom. Mm-hmm. I know what my values are. Yep. All of that combined together will give you the sturdy ground to stand on, to build a life in which it feels worth it to be alive. Right. And I think you probably said this, if not, it's in the realm of what you were saying, but just the surrender, just letting the surrender. Yep. Your ribs surrender, surrender, accept reality on reality's terms. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Because if anything, it's going to teach you a lot, but if anything, Mm -hmm. you fighting it right now, it's only going to make it worse. Exactly. And I do want to cite and say that so much of what I'm sharing is it's not only the clinical wisdom that I've gained through the years, like so many of these principles are outlined in what's called DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, which I love. Mm -hmm. This is also indigenous wisdom. So this is wisdom that indigenous medicine healers, indigenous keepers of wisdom have always known that we can't survive alone. We need community that you can trust your body. Yeah. That nature is all healing in in a light. Nature is healing, living in alignment with spirit and faith and surrender. This is indigenous wisdom. This didn't just come from my training. Right. Or white people or white people (laughs) in general, our entire world as we know it. Exactly. So I just wanted to name that as well, that like a lot of the ideas that I'm sharing are not organic to my culture. Yeah. Which that's actually not true. I've been really diving into my, um, uh, my lineage and Uh and doing my ancestral work because, uh, that's been a huge part of my healing journey. Um, especially in like being clear enough to actually have the capacity to do this. Mm -hmm. I've been digging deep, deep, deep into, um, Italian folk healer medicine and Italian shamanism, indigenous Italian shamanism. And these principles are also found there. So indigenous people all over the world, shamans all over the world hold this wisdom. 
Right. I mean, it was, you know, people who have come before us, our ancestors, we didn't have all of these things, you know, that we rely on today or that we use to cope today. We didn't have hospitals, like in the traditional sense, all of these things that are supposed to cure you and now you're set off to life. Yeah, these are like mm-hmm. rooted, rooted, rooted rituals and things that have been done for time and time again. And it's all within mm-hmm. us too, which is, yeah, the beautiful thing is we yeah. are all healing, but Western society tells us, keeps us sick and then keeps us going mm-hmm. to the doctor and all of these things. Yeah, we won't, we won't even get mm-hmm. into that. <laughs> another hour and a half I know I know I love that you've been diving deeper into your own ancestral lineage oh my god it's amazing I can't even begin to explain the difference it's made in my life especially as an adoptee so this work is like actually one of the things that I really highly encourage um, in the earth module of wild morning when we're learning about the element of earth, because our lineage, our ancestry is absolutely connected to our sense of the earth element. Like how do we, how did we get here? What are the bones and the blood that make up our systems? Yeah. How do I get that tether back to the earth that was cut? Right. Ancestry work. Yeah. And ancestry work and then our own just trauma work. Like my, again, my Mm -hmm. spiritual healer, Candace, she says, we go through so much trauma initially when we are born, we're grabbed Mm -hmm. by doctors and, you know, we're getting stuff sucked out of our nose and stuff. And we're being, we don't have any autonomy over our little bodies for actually a long time. And, you know, you've experienced this well into your childhood, you had no autonomy at certain times. And that, and when you were talking about your hips, Candace also says that most of our childhood trauma is stored in the hips and most of our trauma is stored there. So I love that you're doing this little nightly routine because that's <laughs> where both of our issues, everyone's issues, every single person, mm-hmm. it's, in the hips. it's there. And yeah. Body, yeah. It knows the story all of our bodies, but it's hard. Yeah. And we, but we will silence it (laughs) because we have to be attuned and present enough to listen and to let it go. And oftentimes we cannot do it alone. We need a compassionate witness. Yes. Yes. That's the key. Right. Absolutely. A group of friends or just even one person that is along with Mm -hmm. you in your journey and Mm -hmm. listen and support. That should be my job title. Don't call me a therapist. Call me a compassionate witness. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That's my job. Love it. <laughs> compassionate witness. Yeah. Cause that's what, I mean, that's what you are. You're, yeah. You're not, you're not a psychologist. You're not anybody like, you know, this is what we're going to prescribe you medicine wise. You're going to do this, 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 and then you're going to get to your achievement. It's just like, that's what therapy is, which is so beautiful. It's just being able to have the space where the person can reflect themselves back mm-hmm. to themselves. And you're just, oh yeah, compassionate with this. I like that. <laughs> Put that on your business card. Nico Salvatio, yes. professional, compassionate MD, profa- <laughs> compassionate with this. Oh my God. Someone recently told me that I'm a slasher and I was like, what the fuck is a slasher? And they were uh-huh. like, because you're a counselor slash therapist slash artist slash poet slash podcaster slash writer oh my <laughs> god does that make me a slasher too because i kind of love yes. it yes you're a slasher oh you're slash slasher. compassionate witness slash compassionate witness slash psychedelic therapist yes. guide yes Jesus. oh my gosh and you yes, you were and then you really delved into different forms of medicine recently too when you went to jamaica and that was revolutionary mm-hmm. transform transform mm-hmm. not just the person but how you can facilitate healing to others in the future yeah 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 amazing yeah the ancestry work really opened up for me through my medicine work in yeah. jamaica and we won't even get into all the problematic shit that happened um working for a colonial company in a yeah. um really historically you know abused and violated country you can just imagine. Um, but the medicine, you know, I'm loyal to the medicine. Yeah. And I will say this is a big debate in the sober world. 
but I am someone who thinks that psychedelic therapy, like psychedelic assisted therapy has a time and a place in a sober person's recovery. Absolutely. Yeah. I still think there's a place for that. For sure. Big component on believing that everybody needs to do psychedelics at one point in their life because it's something that no one else can show you or teach you. And mm-hmm. you're going you're to take whatever you take from each medicine, you know, dose. And it's just, it's fascinating. Yeah. It's a really beautiful fit for most folks, a lot of folks. And for some folks, I, I would say like with the caveat, like with certain pre-existing um, medical conditions or uh, mental uh, diagnoses, Mm-hmm. veer away because it can worsen right. issues um right. you know however that's not the case for most people right exactly yeah so just yeah. be discerning be right. you know check in with your own inner wisdom your own inner compass there yeah like for example folks with a history of schizophrenia are probably not the best candidates for psychedelic assisted therapy because it can really exacerbate their symptoms right facts stuff like that yeah so let's we can talk about like this one other topic if you don't mind chatting about this because this is something that's been new for me yeah I have been navigating well so you know always navigating a lot in life but as someone who has been celibate for so long and who only has ever had one partner and that was a cisgendered man I have come to this place where I am queer, I believe, and I, I wish people could see me because I'm doing a little happy dance, (laughs) but there's just been such a release in this weird way that I didn't think there would be because there's, because it's also not like I'm dating or inner, like having intercourse Mm -hmm. with other people. I'm just coming to this new identification of myself and knowing that like, I am, I have the low level of attraction because of being asexual, but I am open to all people, non-binary men, women, like being 2022, I'm kind of shying away from men a little bit more, (laughs) But but there's just been this coming into myself that I've always kind of felt that I was, but I never just had like that proper label or anything. Mm -hmm. So what was your experience for you? Because you used to be married. A straight married woman. Straight married woman. And like, and I got to see you bloom, like out your tail end of Mika, straight woman, identity, she, her. And now I've seen you blossom into who you are. And Mm. queer is amazing and beautiful. And it's, and it's also this giant umbrella that so many of us can fall under that we feel Mm -hmm. like this is us. So how was you, how, how was your journey through all of that? Woo. That's a big question. I know. Sorry. We're just going to end on Big topic. I love it. First, I'll say, Kendra, to you, congratulations. Welcome to the community. You're amazing. I love you. you. Um, And second, that even if you never date or have sex with someone who is the same gender as you or transgender or non-binary, you are still valid in your queerness. Yes. Yes. Only you can know what is true for you right and so fuck anybody who tells you oh well you're not a real queer person if you haven't had sex with a woman or you're not a real queer person if you haven't had a long-term relationship with you know whatever yeah you know your queerness right um my journey was messy yeah (laughs) because it was also in the wake of your mother's death it was like at the same time (laughs) yeah yeah um I went through my sexual awakening in the immediate aftermath of my mother's death. My ex-husband and I decided to open our relationship at that time because there was something about watching my mom die that brought like cold, sharp clarity and urgency to me. 
We had been talking about opening our marriage for years before that because I had noticed attraction to women and it was confusing to me and I just didn't know, you know, how I felt about it. But I also felt deep, deep loyalty and commitment to my ex-husband. How long were you married Um, for again? We were together for 10 years. We were married for five. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, baby. Yeah. We grew each other up. We met when we were 18 years old. We divorced when I was 28. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And I still grieve that relationship. You know, we're not in contact anymore. And a lot of that is because of the messiness of our ending and the messiness of um, my coming out journey. Yeah. Um, That's a significant timeline for the longest relationship that you've ever been in that kind of relationship. That's very significant. Yeah, it is. And then that ending at the same time as my mother dying. So like compounded grief, right? right? Like I really don't know how I survived that time. Having a lot of sex, getting really high. (laughs) There it is. Yep. There There it is. Yep. Writing a lot of poetry. Yes. Um, So I, you know, we opened our marriage and I started dating the first woman that I ever dated. And to this day, I still love her. Mm -hmm. I will never, ever, ever forget her. Yeah. Like she was my awakening. When we got together, it was like everything just clicked into place. It was like, oh my God this is what sex is. This is what passion is. This is what love is. I had never felt anything like that in my life. And that's not to say that to take anything away from the deep love I felt for my ex-husband because he was my best friend. Yeah. It was so different with a woman for me. Yeah. And you know, I won't get into the HBO special that is my divorce. You'll just have to wait for me to write it. (laughs) (laughs) But um, we'll say that there was um, people acting out of their integrity on all sides. So in myself, in him, in the person that he was, the woman he was dating, Mm -hmm. in the woman that I was dating, all of us behaved in ways that were not, you know, in alignment with our integrity. Um, and that led to, you know, the sudden collapse of my marriage. And then, and that also led to the ending of that relationship, that first love relationship with the first woman I was ever with, because I couldn't handle emotionally staying connected with her when in my mind, like I had her coupled with my ex-husband because I met her when I was still with him. And so it was too painful for me. Yep. to remain in relationship with her because it was just too close. Like if I stayed with her, I was going to stay connected to my ex-husband somehow because yeah. her ex-wife ended up marrying my ex-husband. I told you it's an HBO special. The look of <laughs> shock on my face right now. Oh my God. So there was no way for me to be in relationship with her without staying connected to my ex-husband. There would have been and no I separation was... that you needed in order to move on from that mm-hmm. relationship and that time of your life. Yeah. And, and I, I really needed it. And then that's when, you know, and I think so many queer people experience this, especially queer people who come out later in life, you really do go through a second adolescence. Like part of my hypersexuality was just trying to figure out what the fuck I liked and who I liked and what yeah. I liked and yeah. how I liked it. And yeah, you know, just experimenting. Right. Um, so messy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but through it all, I found myself. Right. Yeah. There's so much that I've been recently learning specifically about asexuality and how there's a little bit of like this wall between a lot of people, even in the queer community and asexuals, because the queer community was built on, I can have sex with whoever I want. I can love whoever I want. But when it comes to asexuals, it's like, we don't have those desires. And it was almost like we didn't fit under this umbrella of people who fought for so long and so hard to have their love be valid and worth, you know, worthy and worthy to them and everything. So it's Mm -hmm. been like a weird 
coming out sort of thing for me because it's like I have felt this way a lot of my life. I just didn't have the definition or the term for it. I feel attraction when I do feel attraction. There's no gender there. It's not specifically someone who is mask presenting or femme presenting. It doesn't matter if they're identifier or a man as a woman. It's very little attraction, but it's there's no, I'm not hard on one side or the other. Like I am a yeah. straight woman or I am a gay woman because I also feel like there's, it's a hard for me to also explore that right now in that realm, which a lot of people who are gay or trans or bi have, that's how they have identified. Figured it out. Right. So I'm like in this weird mm-hmm. bubble of like, I think I'm queer. Yeah. Like, how do I know? It's like, I can know. I don't have to do these other things in order to know, but it's, it's very interesting. Very mm-hmm. interesting. Okay. I'll say this. Queer to me. Yes. Is less about who you have sex with or who you want to have sex with. Queer to me is more about your orientation to the world. And it's more a political lens of how you approach the world. Queer as in radical. Queer as in different, queer as in, um, you know, not, not normal, quote yeah. unquote normal, right? Like standing for something that is if, queerness very much feels like in opposition to for yeah. me. Love that. I relate hard to that. Right. Even just what so you I could do- live a very queer life and never have sex with another person who's the same gender as you, but how you live your life, like, yes queer politics right like anti-capitalist yeah um you know being very involved in social justice movements being very aware of the impact of whiteness in the world yes these these sorts of things right like this is how you move through the world in a queer way and queer for you what does that mean right like maybe maybe you're queer as fuck because you're self-employed and you're taking pictures of naked people that's pretty fucking queer kendra and all types of people. You can be yes. gender. You can be a cis straight white man. You can be a, yeah, you can be gay. You can be two lesbians together. Like, yeah. And I've always lived my life this way, I feel. So I feel like there's this hard identity where it's like, yes, I'm queer. But that part of me is like, do I have to sexually no, validate that? But you, but you just answered that for me. That's just how I live. And that's why I've always said, like, I've always felt this way, but I didn't have the labels, but it, yeah. it was, but there, the labels can kind of get a little convoluted when, you know, being a part of the LGBT movement was so like, this is who I am at my core and this is who I choose to love. But I love that. Mm-hmm. Thank you for saying that because that was total validation after validation after validation. Yeah. 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 And maybe some queer folk out there won't agree with what I'm saying. And that's okay. Cause that's queer too. Right. <laughs> Yes, it is. In opposition. Yes, it <laughs> is. Oh, I fucking love that, Nico. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. And then the second part of my coming out journey was the gender stuff of like figuring out that I'm non-binary, non-binary. and that I'm actually not a woman. Yes. Um, I and- loved your podcast episode it, that said, I am not a woman, yet I bleed. Yes. Thank you. It could have also been a writing as well, but yeah. it was, yeah, very powerful stuff. Yeah, it was. I wrote it out and then I read it. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank you for gassing me up on the podcast. I've not touched it in months and months and months. And a, a big part of that was, you know, the heartbreak that I went through. I met my previous partner through my podcast. And so there's Great. something about returning to it that has felt very difficult for me. Um, sure. But I do feel the call to go back to it because it feels like it's important work. It is. It really is. And so, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your encouragement. Of course, being able to speak from the queer asexual lens that not a lot of people understand and being able to talk through the queer non-binary lens, which a lot of people don't understand. It's very right. it's important work that we're both doing and just trying to share. But like we were talking about earlier, especially with habits or 
consistency, you can always go back to something. It's not. Yes. And it's like in the podcast, it's still there. Like you've got all your episodes out that you do have out right now. And it's just, yeah. wait, it, it will always be waiting for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks, I'm excited Kendra. that you just said that though, because I mean, me over here, like loving your podcast, I'm just excited for more from you, but of course at your own, at your own pace and at your own rate, I took like three months off. I like started the podcast and then it was like fucking depression, van shit, yeah. I didn't didn't record, did an interview people for three months after I had like just started it, but you yep. need time. Yep. Yeah. And that's also a very clear thing to do because you're not operating in that like se- that socialized sense of urgency exactly. around productivity. Exactly. And productivity and professionalism all based oh my around God. the white fucking lens. You need to be yes. doing this. You need, yeah. No, fuck that shit. I'm queer. Fuck that shit. <laughs> yes, exactly. You totally are. You know I mean? Actually, that would be a great sticker. Fuck that shit. Comma. I'm queer. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but yes. so much truth. You can always go back to it whenever. I love that. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you too. Pause for silence. Yay. Seriously though, I mean, I really am. It's and yeah, like I didn't even think about that until we started talking. I came in your life when you were like in fucking turmoil and yep it's yeah it's just been a joy to watch you grow and it's just I think I said this to you once but I'll say it again and remind me if I've said this to you or not when I first met you you made me very nervous (gasps) and it was because I had never seen or been around someone that was that vulnerable and not only that vulnerable but that expressive around what they were going through and like you're grieving and it wasn't just like oh hey how are you feeling oh yeah you know surface level stuff like you got into it and then you would ask me questions and I was like I've never experienced this from someone and it could be just you know you you as in like your job like that's kind of like what your your juice what you love to do but you always made me so nervous. And when I sat with that and I was like, I think it's because they're challenging me, not, not intentionally, but that's what made me feel nervous. And then I've just been, I've just, I've loved getting to know you and being and w- witnessing your vulnerability too, because it's just, it's inspirational. And again, like you even doing your podcast gave me such inspiration to do this. And there were so much nerves and fear surrounded with this. And there still is, Mm -hmm. but I just think like, just be open. There's nothing can hurt with just being yourself and being vulnerable and Mm -hmm. like indirectly taught me a lot about just who you were and how you are as a person. Oh my God. You could see me trying to like hold back my laughter. (laughs) because it's just like you're right during that time I was just like a leaking like faucet of vulnerability because I couldn't help it like it was just coming out of me I didn't have a choice and 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 um I love that though because that's how we were able to get to know each other like really know each other yes and Um, we're taught to bottle things in not talk about mm -hmm. not bring other people down and here you were like my mother okay (laughs) okay you're gonna you're gonna listen to what I'm about to say and let's we're just gonna go for it here and (gasps) I love that because there's not a lot of people out there like you who will be that radical with their vulnerability yeah, thank you. And it's you. what led you to your own podcast too, which is why I love it so much yeah. and hearing from that lens and yeah. Yeah. No, it's special for sure. It's crazy. I had this dream a couple of weeks ago um about moving back to Seattle. Yeah. And I had this dream where one of my dearest dearest friends was explaining to me why so many people in Seattle are mad at me. And I know your face. <laughs> okay (laughs) you're like okay all right but the truth is is like during that time I burned a lot of bridges and a lot of relationships just went up in flames because they those relationships could not hold grief yes 
and they could not hold my expression of grief. And the dear, dear friend in the dream said to me, people were so mad at you because you refused to hide your grief and they didn't want to see it. Mm -hmm. Because when people are uncomfortable, they don't like that. Right. And just like you said, that's challenging because when you're around someone who is openly grieving and this, I know we've been talking forever, but this feels so fucking important to say when we are grieving and we are an open wound, we are a walking open wound, which is what I was. People will turn away from you that you never expected to turn away from you. And The people who are willing to turn towards you in that time are your people. Yes. Because grief is the ultimate truth teller. It will show you exactly who is meant to be in your life and exactly who is meant to fall away. And that's why so many people's lives are completely upended and disrupted by these big grief experiences. Even just, I mean... For sure. But even just other life experiences that could happen, Mm -hmm. you lost like a whole bunch of people in your life. That's, I mean, that's still grief. That's still grief. You're right. It actually just goes back to it. But when you're so open and vulnerable, that can open wound. Yeah. So for me, I was like, shit, they make me uncomfortable. Should I just turn around and not speak to them again? No. Because I'm learning more about myself through them being so open about where they're at in life. Yeah. And yeah. Then, so yeah. The whole one who turned towards. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, I was just going to say they're not shying away, but saying, you know, I've been in similar situations. There's times in my life where I am not perfect. And it, it's those people who, who are there with you after transition, after transition. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And the reason that people turn away because of their own discomfort is because that is how culture has socialized us to be around grief. We've right. completely sanitized and individualized the experience of grief as something that you're supposed to just handle on your own or just get over or just get get over over it. it. The average amount of time that most jobs give for bereavement is three days. If you're lucky enough to even get bereavement time, which is fucked, very fucked. And so people get angry when people are unwilling to hide their grief because they somewhere along the way had to hide their grief. And so resentment builds it. Like, how dare you make such a scene? How dare you just let yourself fall apart, pull it together. Right. How dare you go about life differently than I did? Right. Which is like white supremacy and colonialism in a a nutshell. Totally. So the decolonization of grief work is working with grief and community, which is exactly what wild mourning is, which is the opportunity to experience being witnessed compassionately, going through ritual with, um, you know, the elements in nature and being able to talk story and be and, and have creative outlets with your grief. Yeah. In community. Yeah. Which is basically what you provided for me, Kendra. I'm so glad Mm -hmm. because I remember when we went to Leavenworth and you said you were like, you were just there and you just listened and that's, and that's all anybody can ever do. But that's what I'm also really good at too. Cause I love stories and I love to learn from other people that aren't my family or how I was brought up in my whole life. But that, thank you. That, that means a lot. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad yeah, I was thank able to you. be there for you during a time. And I didn't even know that until like years later. And yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I love you. Oh, love you so much. <laughs> thank you for doing this. You are the best. We may have to have a Nico episode part two down the line. <laughs> Deal. Talk about a totally different topic. We can talk about psychedelics. Yeah. We can talk about the patriarchy. We can talk about whatever we want. <laughs> Let's talk mushrooms. Let's talk mushrooms. <laughs> Let's talk Actually, mushrooms. you and I have had so many psychedelic experiences together too. We have, and we need to continue for the future for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We should definitely chat about that next time. Thank you so much for being here though. I really appreciate it and talking. And this was such a great episode and I am like, 
ecstatic for people to hear this. So thank you. you. Thank you, Kendra. Bye, everybody out there. We love you. Oh, thank you guys so much for being here for this episode with Nico and I. I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, this was a really, really fun conversation to talk about. And, you know, us being friends, we can kind of tangent off into some things. And I thought it was really great. And I hope you did too. I just wanted to let you know if you were interested in following along with Nika and their work, you can find them on Instagram at Nika Silvaggio. N-I-C-A-S-E-L-V-A-G-G-I-O. You can also find their podcast, the non-binary, the non, excuse me, the non-binary body image project, and uh, their work with Wild Morning as well. And I just wanted to also mention and say that if you have been enjoying this podcast, definitely let me know. Feel free to find me on Instagram at KendraKphoto.com or that's my website. So there you go. And then also at Instagram at Kendra K photo. And you can see every time that I post a new episode, if you want to use that bottom portion in the comment section to talk about the episode, I would genuinely absolutely love it. And if you would like to be a guest on this episode, contact me, you can reach me via my email, my website, Um, I have contact information on Instagram. So definitely reach out. I'm always looking for more people to interview. And one last thing, if it isn't too much of a hassle, if you are listening on Spotify, it would be amazing if you could rate this podcast. Um, All you have to do is just swipe up, hit the star button and rate it one out of five stars, whatever you want. Um, It would just be really cool to get some ratings coming in and seeing what you guys think of the podcast. But again, um, definitely head over to Instagram if you have some time and you want to ask a question or chat about the episode. I would genuinely love nothing more. All right, everybody take care.